The internet provides some amazing opportunities and some really complex challenges for freedom of expression. John Perry Barlow tells us that the internet is the new home of the mind. This dream is of a place where everyone can be free to seek and express any information that they like. The great potential of the internet is its ability to democratize speech. Unlike the broadcast era or the mass media era, the internet allows ordinary individuals like you and me to be heard by potentially millions of people worldwide. It allows communication across time and space and across national borders. This is potentially revolutionary. It's often heralded as a revolution in democracy itself. Time magazine in 2006 named you the ordinary citizen its person of the year. The optimistic view of uh, this great change in how we communicate is that it democratizes speech. It enables all of us to participate in making meaning and in seeking information, whether that is um, commercial information, educational resources, or entertainment. It provides us with a direct pipeline into all of recorded human culture and history and a direct ability to reach any audience who cares to listen. This has never been the case with broadcast media. Um, you would always had to have a publisher behind you in the past. The big change of the internet is that anyone can be a publisher. But it does create new gatekeepers. There are new intermediaries, whether they're search engines or the content hosts or the people who provide the pipes to make internet communication possible. These are new, usually private institutions that have a huge ability to control what we can see and what we can say online. In many cases though, the freedom that the internet provides seems almost unlimited, absolute. Dan Gilmore famously said that the internet treats censorship as damage and roots around it. Stuart Brand said, information wants to be free. And there's a logic underlying this rhetoric that it is really hard to control the flow of information online. It is extremely difficult to target the speakers who might be anywhere. They might be anonymous, difficult to, fight, to track down, or just outside of jurisdictional reach. They might be so numerous that they're difficult to effectively police. When information is removed from the internet, it usually pops up very quickly in many other places. This creates a nightmare for government control over speech. And depending on your point of view, provides a wonderful opportunity for freedom of expression to circulate online. But there are problems, right? Article 19 of the ICCPR provides protection for freedom of expression, but its protections are not absolute. This leads us to a series of ongoing problems and conflicts with freedom of speech online. The first are traditional freedom of speech questions about how we can protect the freedom of individuals to access and to impart information. So there are serious problems with direct state intervention limiting freedom of speech and the abuse of state created rules designed to limit speech on the internet. There are ongoing tensions around international conflicts as different jurisdictions seek to limit the flow of information online. There are also serious ongoing and under-examined problems with the new gatekeepers, the private intermediaries that make speech online possible. Because these are private intermediaries, they typically have few restrictions or few responsibilities to protect the free speech rights of the individuals who use their networks. So there is an ongoing struggle at the moment about how we can ensure that the way that these intermediaries are governed, indeed, the way the internet is governed, can protect the human rights of individuals, protect both the speech interests and other rights of individuals to be free from harm or abuse or hate speech, for example, online. So to start with state censorship, there are ongoing problems and struggles over the extent to which the state should be involved in limiting access to information online. 
In Australia, we've gone through a series of debates on internet censorship and filtering, where the Labor government, starting from 2008, sought to introduce a mandatory internet filter to filter out offensive speech. Note, importantly, that this is not speech that is necessarily illegal, but speech that exceeds the rules of the current classification system that apply to mass media and other physical distribution channels. In the end, the Australian government couldn't get through its plans to introduce mandatory ISP filtering in Australia, but it's still seeking to find some way to enforce the classification regimes that we have for offline publications to internet publications. Further abroad, many countries are seeking to regulate the type of content that is accessible on the internet. So for example, uh, Russia has asked Twitter to block the accounts or suspend the accounts of pro-Ukraine activists. Turkey has famously blocked access to Twitter altogether um, and now requires Twitter to zone its services so that speech that is critical of the Turkish government is not accessible within Turkey to Turkish citizens. These countries aren't alone. There are many countries around the world that impose restrictions on what sort of content can be transmitted. Some of these might be in breach of Article 19's requirements. And then there are massive procedural problems. So one of the ways in which we regulate speech on the internet is through a procedure called notice and takedown. Now to put this in context, Google alone receives 32 million notices a month from private organizations asking it to remove content that is accessible through its services. So typically this is removing links from its search engines and removing content from YouTube. In most cases, this deals with, copyright, with content that is alleged to infringe copyright. Notice and takedown is one of those procedures that really make it possible to actually and practically police the content on the internet. Notice and takedown imposes strong uh, potential liability on the private organizations that make con communications possible online and requires them to follow a procedure to remove content that is apparently infringing. The real problem is that intermediaries are not courts. They don't have the legitimacy of our judicial system when making decisions about what content is permissible and what content is not. So the system is fraught with abuse. There are many, many examples of people using notice and takedown procedures to silence critical speech, to um, hurt or harm their competitors, or just to protect their personal interests in ways that the um, legislatures had not necessarily intended, but because there's few mechanisms for review, and because it is hard to find out what exactly, on what exact grounds speech has been removed by private intermediaries, there are few protections for people who've been wronged. The sheer number of these types of requests causes real problems for the intermediaries who can't afford to dedicate a lot of resources to check the veracity of the allegations. But the bigger problem is procedural. Intermediaries are not in a position to be able to make determinations of facts and law. They're private entities to whom we have devolved the responsibility for policing content on the internet. So there's a real tension here for states as we grapple for ways in which we can find efficient mechanisms to enforce the law. And typically that requires devolving power to enforce the law and responsibility for enforcing the law to private intermediaries. And the need to balance that against our desire to protect freedom of speech and ensure that people's rights are adequately looked after, that there are rights of appeal and other procedural fairness provisions in place to ensure that we don't end up over restricting the um, freedom of speech. This leads us into the second key issue that we're seeing play out at the moment, which is around the power of private intermediaries, not necessarily to make decisions um, imposed upon them by governments, but in making decisions to censor speech for their own particular ends. So the internet is essentially run by a series of private corporations. These are the intermediaries that provide 
the pipes, the infrastructure over which communications flow, the servers, the content hosts, the social media platforms that people use to connect and share information. These private intermediaries have a huge amount of power. So search engines like Google control what sort of information people can seek and how and what they will find in, result to, in response to a search. Organizations like Facebook increasingly are responsible for controlling the types of information that is presented to us in our daily lives. That's a huge amount of power wielded by massive private corporations. But because they're private corporations, they're typically not bound by constitutional protections. Constitutional rights apply against the government. In previous times, it was always the government that we were most wary of interfering with our constitutional and human rights. This is sometimes problematic. Facebook, for example, has admitted to manipulating the feeds of its users, the news feeds of its users, in order to influence their mood. All of these private companies also have their own policies about what sort of speech is acceptable and what is not. And these policies don't always align with public ideas of what sort of speech limits are acceptable. So, for example, on Facebook, male nipples are permissible, but female nipples are forbidden. Pictures of beheadings are okay, but pictures of people breastfeeding are not. There are a lot of content decisions that are made by these private organizations. Depictions of marijuana are okay, but other drug use is not. The way in which these rules are set and enforced is largely opaque. We don't have a very good understanding of how these companies make decisions. This leads to a lot of conflict as people try to get these private organizations to do more, to take more responsibility, to protect the rights of individuals. These new gatekeepers are under increasing pressure to justify their policies and how their policies are enforced. This issue becomes even more complex when we deal with real conflicts of rights. So, for example, um, addressing the problem of hate speech online. Remember that freedom of speech is not an absolute freedom. There are limits to what sort of speech is acceptable in modern society. So in particular, there are many people who complain that private intermediaries don't do enough to prevent or limit the flow of hate speech on their networks. In recent years, this comes up a lot in regards to gender-based hate speech in particular. But there are lots and lots of examples of when people are subject to really quite vile abuse and threats for merely belonging to a minority group or expressing an unpopular opinion. In some cases, this depends upon your particular conception of freedom of speech. If you mean freedom of speech merely in the negative sense, as in the government may impose no restrictions on speech unless they meet certain criteria, then these sorts of things are not necessarily problematic. If, however, you have a more full or substantive conception of freedom of speech, there are real problems here, as we see people with minority or unpopular opinions drowned out and prevented from exercising their freedom of speech by the masses of people who target them for abuse. One of the key problems with internet regulation is that we don't have any easy way to answer these questions and we don't have easy ways to enforce the law. We need the cooperation of private companies in order to protect rights and enforce responsibilities online. So the private intermediaries, search engines, social network platforms, content hosts, they're all increasingly being asked to do more to police the content of speech on their networks and to control the bounds of acceptable speech. This creates a really interesting, complex and difficult conflict. On the one hand, private intermediaries don't have the legitimacy of territorial courts and the due process provided by our judicial system when they're making decisions about what content must be removed and what content must be allowed to stay. On the other hand, if we don't enlist these private organizations, there is no real way to enforce legal rules and social norms about acceptable speech. 
Finding a way to balance these two problems is one of the essential problems of internet regulation in modern times. The United Nations Guiding Principles on Businesses and Human Rights explains that businesses have a responsibility to address adverse human rights impacts with which they are involved. Civil society groups are using this new language of responsibility to require intermediaries, private intermediaries, to do more to protect not just freedom of speech, but freedom to speak and freedom to be free from abuse and vilification. Civil society groups are increasingly getting more sophisticated at getting intermediaries to cooperate. There have been large successes in the case of, say, um, Twitter doing more to address hate speech on its network or Facebook agreeing to implement its policies in a more fair or more transparent manner. So the most interesting debates of the internet right now are about what responsibility these private firms should actually bear. So this proceeds in a number of ways. The first way is an increasing responsibility on private intermediaries to do more to resist the erosion of freedom to speech online. This manifests as a responsibility to be more transparent and accountable when private firms remove information or hand over the identifying personal details of people who post information on their networks on behalf of governments. Second, it also manifests as a mounting pressure on private platforms to do more, to be more transparent, to be more careful and more accountable when they make decisions to remove or not remove content on their networks. So for example, there are large debates about the appropriateness of the terms of service and acceptable use policies of the various social networks. And there is a lot of pressure mounting on these intermediaries to be clearer about when they will remove content and when they will provide users with a guarantee of their freedom of speech. In particular, there's mounting pressure for these intermediaries, these platforms, to do more to police the hate speech that silences people or the abuse that flows on their networks, whether that's bullying or other types of abuse that really impacts on the individuals who use their networks. Increasingly, we talk about platforms having some responsibility to enforce their terms of service and enforce community expectations of what is acceptable speech and what should be prohibited speech. Ultimately, though, we just don't have a lot of information about what decisions are being made, by whom, and on what grounds. There are, without that information, there is little protection for due process and little accountability of the actions that private platforms take.